This is the Build Wealth Canada podcast, episode number 45. Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. Today, I'm excited to have Ed Rempel back on the show, who is one of the top financial planners that I go to whenever I have questions or need a second opinion about my investments, financial planning, or on how to optimize my taxes. And today, we're going to tackle the debate of whether you should focus on growth versus dividends when it comes to your investing. Now, dividends are, of course, very popular. Everybody likes having that passive cash flow show up in their accounts. But are we limiting our net worth if we focus too much on dividends as opposed to choosing more balanced and growth-oriented portfolio. And also in this episode, we'll talk about how to best withdraw money from your investment portfolio and how to decide if you should be withdrawing from your equities, your bonds, or your cash cushion instead. And we also talk about changing interest rates and the impact that you can expect them to have on your portfolio, as well as some tips on what to choose for the bond portion of your portfolio. Now, just to give you a bit of a background on Ed, he's been a certified financial planner, so a CFP professional for over 22 years, and he's been a professional accountant for over 33 years with a CPA and CMA designation. Now, personally, I find that when I ask him questions, his decades of experience as both a financial planner and a professional accountant really helps me feel secure that he has all the bases covered as he has a holistic view from both of those worlds due to all that experience. He's also written nearly 1,000 financial plans for Canadians, over that time. So he's truly as experienced as it gets in this field. And he has extensive knowledge on some of the higher level investment strategies out there. And if you like what you hear from Ed, you can learn more about him and actually sign up for a free 30 minute consultation with him where you can ask him some of your questions. And you can get that by going to buildwealthcanada.ca slash Ed. So just E-D. Now, before we dive into this episode, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our sponsor, canspace.ca, Canada's favorite web hosting provider. Now, if you're a local business, a startup, or an entrepreneur, and you're looking to improve your online presence, then you definitely need a top quality provider. For example, we all know that your business's success depends on having a website that is reliable and loads as fast as possible. Now, Canspace has been trusted for over 10 years by Canada's largest corporations for providing affordable, reliable web hosting with the fastest load times in the industry. Industry. Now, having a website that is down frequently or just loading slowly can cost you business and, more importantly, damage the reputation of your brand. So, choosing a reputable web hosting provider like Canspace helps avoid these issues. Also, Canspace offers award winning support, bills in Canadian dollars, and has a very generous 30 day money back guarantee. And if you have a website already, they'll even help you set up and transfer everything for free. So if you need to change providers or are looking to launch your latest idea, CanSpace can help. And as of this episode, all Build Wealth Canada listeners will get $10 off the plan of their choice. Also, even if you're just considering starting your own blog or business one day, then I suggest you still go grab the coupon now as it's a free $10 and the discount might not be available forever. And you can always use that coupon later when you're ready to get started. So to do that, just visit buildwealthcanada.com dot ca slash host and enter your email address to get the coupon that's buildwealthcanada.ca slash host h-o-s-t and now let's get into the show all right ed welcome to the show Thanks for having me, Cornell. No problem. It's good to have you back. And uh, Ed, you wrote a great article about living on self-made dividends, which I found really interesting because it's a way to actually have some more control on how much income you actually receive from your investments. Can you give us a synopsis of the article? Uh, Of course, right. So self-made dividends is an interesting concept, and it's actually better than ordinary dividends in every way. So first, let me explain what they are. So self-made dividends... Uh, is actually pretty simple. Really, all it means is uh, instead of investing for dividends, you uh, if you need some cash flow, you sell a bit of your investment each month or every two weeks or once a year, however, however often you want. And that's it. So you pay whatever capital gains applies to that. Um, but you, you get your cash flow that way. And I found, for example, for uh, for my clients when they're retiring, far more effective to get the cash flow that they want from self-made dividends than from using dividends. And just to, just to explain why it's all better. So first of all, taxes are lower uh, for, for pretty well everybody because only a small part of what you're selling is the capital gain. And, and capital gains are, are um, 
are taxed at lower rates. So really, it's using you're essentially using deferred capital gains because you know if you sell an investment, part of what you uh, what you sold was your your original investment, and then there's only the the part that's a gain, and only half of that is taxable. So you're paying less tax than you would with with regular dividends, and you're not forced to take uh, you know if you're if you're not yet taking any income. If, um, um, most people, when they retired, what they really need is cash flow, not income. And before they retired, they don't really need anything. So, so it's uh, uh, cash uh, uh, income is taxable cash flow. So, and dividends are a form of, of income here. So, it it's tends to be uh, tends to be uh, you know all taxable. While if, if you're taking these self made dividends, it's not. So, before you retire, um, so you also have complete control. Of the dividend that you get. So before you retire, you probably want to have a div self-made dividend rate of zero, right? So you pay no more tax than you need. You leave all your money invested. The day you retire, you snap your finger and you instantly change it on to four percent or whatever amount you want, and you start taking your cash flow from it. Well, if for people that are investing for dividends, they have to take dividends all the way along while they're building wealth and they're paying tax on all the dividends, and then later on when they retire, there's only so much control they have. So with self-made dividends, you pay less tax. You have better investment options. Um, you're um, uh, you have complete control over what you want, uh, how much or how little you want. And you can uh, you take you can change at any time. And also after you retire, you you don't you're not subject to um, all the clawbacks in the same way. So just to explain that a little bit more. If you're um, for people buying dividends. Are focusing on dividends, they tend to, to have pretty well all their money in Canada because that's where the lower dividend rate is, or they tend to focus on you know the, the higher paying sectors, the higher dividend sectors, you know like utilities and telecoms and stuff. But if you're if you're a self made um, dividend investor or you're basically a growth total return investor, then you can invest anywhere in the world. You can uh, buy whatever sectors make the most sense. You can be fully diversified by the index, and you don't have to worry about you know, chasing yield. Well, what what's the yield on this on this portfolio? Um, the other thing is, you know, I think a lot of people have heard that uh, you know you can get fifty thousand a year tax free uh, if you're being dividend if you're getting dividends and you have no other income. Um, that is true, except that it only is true uh, if you have no other income, if you're single. And if you're under 65, so as soon as you turn 65, that rule is gone completely. And so if you're 65 and you have no other income and you get a dividend, it's immediately subject to a 70% that 70 clawback because low income seniors get the guaranteed income supplement, uh, which is clawed back in 50% of your taxable income. And dividends are grossed up by 38%. So if you get a 10,000 dividends, it shows it's 13,800 of taxable income. You lose fifty percent of thirteen thousand eight hundred in, in a clawback. So all these all these advantages of dividends tend to disappear for uh, for retirees. So I think that's so that's kind of the, the basic uh, the basic thing. But when you look at all the advantages of dividends or of uh, and compare dividends versus versus self made, self made are always better in every way. And then you, you mentioned with uh, how, how you, in order to get that uh, the around fifty thousand you know tax free uh, kind of you know income from dividends in order to get that you said being single is sort of one of the requirements. Oh, why is that exactly? How how does that work? Well, um, if you're so under sixty five and you have no other income, mm -hmm. but you're married. Assume your spouse's income. Your spouse gets to claim a tax credit uh, uh, based on you. They claim you as a dependent. Oh, okay, and that tax credit is again twenty percent. It's basically twenty percent of taxable income, but uh, your taxable if you don't get a ten thousand dividend again, it's thirteen thousand eight hundred of taxable income. You lose twenty percent of that. So really, you're you're not taxed if you get a dividend, but your spouse uh, is taxed at twenty eight percent on your dividend. Understood. Yeah, basically they get the massive clog back because they're no longer getting that. Uh, credit is, or, or they're getting a re reduced credit that they normally would, uh, they would normally would have gotten more if it, they weren't getting these dividends that were causing the clawback. Is that what that's exactly. what you're saying? Gotcha. Yep, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting, uh, interesting animal. I, I know I was uh, recently helping a family member with um, kind of with their investments as well, and they they're a lower income uh, individual, and so they were getting the the guaranteed income supplement, so the GIS. And what I found really interesting is that because you know a lot of times I find seniors have a very big uh, people have a preference towards dividends, right? Uh, there's just people like having that income coming in. Um, but then I found in, in you know in his particular case uh, because there's that gross up on the dividends here in Canada as well. So I mean if he receives dividends he's getting a really enormous uh, clawback uh, because basically there's the income he's getting from the from the dividends that's actually getting grossed up just because of how taxes work uh, you know here in Canada that's like a whole other subject <laughs> but there's that and so essentially I mean it came down to we actually wanted to minimize or, or to almost try to pretty much eliminate any dividends he receives because he would get or from in Canada because of how massively they would be clawed back uh, because of how massively his GIS would be reduced because of these dividends and so instead the whole strategy was okay let's focus more on the capital gains instead of hope, uh, using dividends to generate the income he needed yeah, exactly exactly cornell yes yeah, d- dividends for low-income seniors dividends are, are a complete disaster yeah it's, yeah 70 percent clawback on your gis <laughs> so yeah, uh, and I read one of your articles where, where you talked, you wrote a great article about that recently. It was in uh, Money Saver magazine, and uh, I, I don't remember how happy blog it was. It was there as well. And uh, uh, and yeah, you, you kind of, um, you explained that a little bit more and, and kind of exactly how that works. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was just interesting how, you know, dividends are seen as this amazing thing. And they can be in certain cases, but it's important to realize it's not that they're not this perfect thing in all cases, right? Uh, like in this case with the GIS, it, it's actually a very, very... Uh, uh, something that can really, really um, hurt hurt the income you're getting from your GIS. Exactly. Yeah. So at, at, in your article, a lot of the points uh, apply to taxable accounts. So in other words, money held outside the RSP and TFSA. However, even when using an RSP or TFSA, I think a lot of us wonder if we should focus our investment portfolio on established companies that have consistently been paying dividends uh, so that we can potentially just live off those dividends or if we should instead be including growth-oriented companies as well in our portfolio. Can you give us your thoughts on this whole dividend stocks versus growth stocks versus a more balanced approach? And I know you covered this a little bit in the previous question, but maybe if you can elaborate a bit. Uh, okay, let me give you a little bit investment wisdom based on based on my experience. So there's lots of ways to invest in equities and stocks, um, but I found there's basically two methods that work, and then there's the two. You know, the, I'll give you two good examples of things that don't work. So what works is buying a broad index. So index investors, you're buying ETFs or you're buying a very broad index that tends to work well, and you stay exposed to everything. You get the overall market index. So that's what works well. The other thing that works well is. Um, I call it also all-star fund managers, so hiring the very best fund managers to manage it for you. So if you're going to go active management, then you then you got to search. The sh- focus should be on who's the very best active managers. So those are, those I think are the two good styles that work. What tends to not work is buying themes and timing the market. So themes is um, uh, you buy something. Like, you see, actually, a lot of it in. Um, in ETF investing, so the you buy dividend. To me, a dividend is, is a theme. It's a, it's an arbitrary subset of the broad uh, market index that that works sometimes, and pretty well all themes will work sometimes and some sometimes not. And um, inter- so um, so the point here is, if you look at the average return of ETF investors, you would expect it to be. Somewhere a little bit lower, the index, maybe half or one percent lower than the index, would be the t- return of their portfolio. But if you actually look at ETF invest- investment portfolios and see what the returns are, typically they are between four and six percent below the index. Why? It's because they buy all these. Uh, uh, there's a tendency to buy all these various themes. You know, so, um, uh, and then what they're doing, and then is you tend to buy the most popular, and you buy, tend to buy what's high, what everybody else is buying. And then when it goes out of favor and doesn't do well, you sell it and, and, and go low um, and sell it low. So if you're going to, if you, this is this is how I see it. If you're going to go index investing, don't be deceived into thinking that you're active management and you're going to buy all these all these uh, theme-based uh, ETFs. It's better to stick with the, with the broad indexes. It, it works a lot better. Ed, sorry, so, just, just to interrupt there, uh, just on the subject of themes, 
I, I, th- I think one that I see a lot in the news uh, now, for example, is the whole you know marijuana industry kind of theme, right? Where I, I think there, there's an ETF even now that that focuses specifically on that, uh, just because of the legalization in Canada. So there's kind of so that's kind of become this hot topic. Um, you know, not too long ago, with Bitcoin being all the rage, there was I believe I think. Uh, out of the, I think they probably launched it by now. I haven't really been following too closely, but there was an actual ETF, like a Bitcoin ETF, I think, where they were going to launch one. So just to clarify, I'm guessing this is another example of, of themes with it that, you, that you speak of, right? Yes, that's one example. So you find themes. Um, I, you know, I look for the one of the things I actually actively look for is I look at uh, ETFs. Um, I look at the ones that with the highest assets uh, and, and which ones of those are not broad based. And plus, you look at just you know what you see on the internet or what you see on BNN, and you look at to see what or on blogs, you see what, what people are talking about, all the various themes. And whatever theme it is, I always avoid them. So you know, we had the text text back in the '90s, and then they crashed. We had in, we had income trusts for a while in the 2005, six, then resources. There's always a various themes that that uh, go in and people kind of pile into them after they become popular. And then they, of course they, they go in and out of favor and then they sell them, uh, sell them when they're not. So right now the most, you see uh, on, you, the ones that you mentioned, marijuana and Bitcoin are kind of the two, uh, the two that, that you see talked a lot about the ones that are actually um, the largest volume in ETFs are dividends and low volatility and covered calls. So those are the kind of the themes. But to me, is whatever whatever theme it is, um, I always I always avoid them. Always assume they're going to lag. And to to me, is you got to remember if if you're an index investor, stay broad, ignore all the themes. If you're an active and manage, if an active investor, then you're probably not the best active investor out there. You can go out and hire better, more better active investors and. and hire a top portfolio manager or buy a couple of mutual funds that have all-star fund managers and you're better off than you trying to actively manage with uh with all these various themes yeah i remember uh, hearing an interesting uh, kind of insight from P- peter hudson he's a pretty kind of you know legendary uh, stock investor here in canada and i remember uh, speaking with him about the um, kind of these themes and he would he basically said that the uh, the the market's going to create what people are are craving, what people want, and so you know when Bitcoin was getting all this publicity, all this uh, you know all these high hopes, all that stuff, then basically there there was no surprise to him that oh there is a Bitcoin ETF that's going to be launched, right? And now with the, the marijuana legalization coming up, right, and everything, maybe a lot of kind of this is a hot topic. A lot of people are interested in it. A lot of people really want to invest in, on that and jump on that bandwagon. And once again, no surprise there that. That, oh, the industry has now created uh, a marijuana ETF, right? And so this is kind of an interesting thing how the, the industry will create these products because they make money off of them and selling these products to investors. And but that doesn't automatically mean that just because the product is there that it's it's a p- great investment and that you should definitely you know put your money into it, right? Just because the just because the product is there, just like in any industry, right? A product just because the product exists doesn't mean it's necessarily a good product or or the best product for you. I mean, it can be, but not not necessarily, right? That's it exactly. It's just the last theme that I got caught up with where I learned this was back in the '90s with the uh, with the tech the tech bubble, and I got you know I got caught in into uh, technology. Of course, we had a good run up there for a while, but um, but you know, interestingly, is if you look at the technology mutual funds that were created, almost all, like the largest volume were created in 2000, not in 1995 when the, the boom started, but in 2000, just before it ended, is, is when all, you know, most, most of them were created. So, and then you look at technologies, interestingly, is it went out, or, out and out of favor. People talked about it less and less. And so BNN used to have a show back then on technology, which they canceled. Now they have, of course, a resource show, right? So, and so technology became out of favor. And then about three years ago, ha- what happened was what I thought was the most bullish sign ever is Morningstar canceled the category of technology. So they took technology funds and just put them into global equity and they even canceled the, the category. But there's, there's gotta be, there's gotta be nothing more bullish than that. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's the themes are, it, what happens is whenever they're popular is when you should avoid them. So, uh, that Peter Hudson's exa- ex- exactly right. So I, I know it's after the 2009, after 2008 
crash. Like in the, in the next while after that, company after company was coming out with, uh, well, first it was corporate bonds, and then it was dividends, global dividends, Canadian dividend funds. And that's been like the, what you see is what the industry produces in mutual funds and what the ETF industry produces. It's always the same thing. It's always the same themes, right? And whatever, whatever they are, this is this is my little wisdom. Just avoid them all. If you're an index investor, always stay broad. Don't get caught, don't, don't get caught up on all the themes. That's really the beauty of, of index investing. The magic of index investing is because it stops you from chasing performance. Because if you're not doing index investing, you're going to chase whatever is already high, and you know, and and you're going to buy all the wrong themes. So, so for index investors, here, here's my advice: uh, the fewer ETFs you have, the better. You know, so I, I actually talked to this woman, Kim, who had she she was embarrassed about her portfolio. She didn't think it was very uh, very good. So I asked, so what's with your portfolio? She says, well, I buy ETFs, but I only have one. I have you know the all the Acqui, the all company uh, world index. So it's so it's it's all cap. You know, all companies. So that's all I have. And I said, so what's wrong with that? She said, well, shouldn't I have like a Canadian fund and a dividend fund and a bond? Like, shouldn't I have other funds? I said, like, why? Like, are, is that, you know, like you've already, you're already very diversified with it, right? And so you don't want to get buying into themes. If you add a Canadian fund, now you're overweighting Canadian. So you're less diversified, not more diversified, right? There's a tendency to think if you have more ETFs, you're more diversified, but quite possibly you're less diversified than just having a broad one. So that's there's my advice. So if, you, if you're an ETF investor, don't don't forget that you're an index investor, and don't get sucked into trying to be uh, uh, an actively managed ETF investor. Right. Yeah. So you're talking about something like that. What, what she had. So something like the like Vigro, like the the what one of the newer uh, Vanguard funds, right, where it holds everything across the entire world from an equity perspective, something like that, right? And so she's wondering, right. shouldn't I have more because this seems too simple? And it's like, well, right. not, not necessarily because you're, you're holding thousands and thousands all across the world, uh, right? Com- right. So, so you actually already are very diversified. Um, that, that, that's what you're referring to, something like that, eh? Right. Something yeah. you're very broad, you're already global, you've got, you're invested in everything. Right. That's a perfect portfolio. Like to me, it's... Uh, it's one ETF is probably better than two, which is probably better than three, which is probably better than four. And if you if you have more than four, that probably means you really believe in active investing and not index investing, and therefore you probably should get out of ETFs totally and or whatever. You should get out of um, self management and just hire top portfolio managers. If you have someone that holds a whole bunch of ETFs, then you got to ask yourself. You know, do do you actually believe in index investing, or do you believe in active management? And if you believe in active management, are you the best active manager out there, or are there better ones somewhere that I can hire? Yeah, right now we have uh, f- from the equity side, we have four um, that we personally invested, in. and and yeah, I, I do kind of like that approach because each each ETF is broad based, and each ETF is for a different geographic area. So one's Canada, one's US. One's international emerging markets, and the other one is kind of established markets. And I find this way it's it's a good um, it gives me kind of good control because they're taxed differently depending on what accounts you can have them in. And so this way I can kind of make sure that each one is put into the correct bucket for the lowest possible, uh, basically to pay the lowest amount of tax possible. So that's why I like kind of that approach because uh, it optimizes things from a, it lets me optimize things from a taxation perspective as opposed to getting something like uh, like Vigro, like the, you know the Vanguard one we just talked about, right? Where it's all kind of in one bucket, and so you can't really split them and put them into different accounts uh, to, to save the money. You kind of have to optimize things from a taxation perspective. So it's kind of a I find it's an interesting trade off, right? Like if you want if you're okay with a bit more complexity, then uh, I, I I like what kind of what, what I'm doing because I know I'm, I'm I have things up optimal from a taxation perspective. But if someone's going for max kind of simplicity, they, they don't want to deal with that. They don't want to deal with the rebalancing. Then yeah, you pay a bit more in fees, but you get something like Vigro, and then you're kind of you know you're kind of off to the races quickly and easily. Even though you know it, it doesn't let you fine tune things um, to kind of you know the highest degree to save that bit in taxes as well. So I don't know what are your what are your thoughts on that. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a very good portfolio. So in essence, you have a global portfolio. Yes. You've got you got fixed percentages, and every one you have is a broad base. Like correct. 
broad-based U.S., a broad-based international, a broad-based Canadian. Exactly. And you're not buying any themes anywhere. And you're doing it because there's multiple accounts and different taxation reasons. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, because now we, we've got you know, we've got non-registered TFSA and RRSP. And yeah, so I, I do want to make sure that it's optimal from that perspective just because the portfolio is kind of uh, grown where it's large enough to actually matter, you know? Exactly. So I think it's a good portfolio. And all the various theme ones out there, I, I would suggest ignore them all. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, all right. So when it comes to uh, withdrawing money from your investments, how can we determine how much to withdraw so that we minimize our risk of running out of money in retirement? All right. So I had a, actually, I did a, a very in-depth study on this, which is on my blog. It's also in the Canadian, Canadian Money Saver magazine. Uh, looking at all the various rules of thumb that advisors use. And the the most common one here that's been used is called the 4% rule. And the idea is you can withdraw 4% of your portfolio and increase it by inflation throughout your your retirement, and it should last at least 30 years. So you have a million-dollar portfolio, 4% is $40,000 a year. You just take $40,000 a year, increase it by inflation every year. The the, the, uh, belief was that that is sustainable for life. What I found when I tested it through 150 years of history is, yes, it is sustainable. With about a 97% uh, of the time through history, it has worked if you have an equity-focused portfolio, 70% or more. But for most seniors who have much more conservative portfolios, it didn't work. So I think the rule that you should use is a 2.5%, Plus 0.2 for every 10% you have in stocks. Okay, so if you're um, 80, 20, 80% bonds, 20% stocks, you go 2.5 plus uh, 0.2 twice, so you're 2.9. That can be a, a good withdrawal rate. All right, so um, so I think th- that's the best. You can use that kind of rule to try to uh, determine how much is reasonable to withdraw. So, so basically, what the study found is surprising is people tend to think that the more stocks you have, the more risky it is. But stocks are more risky short term. But believe it or not, stocks are actually less risky long term. The 20 year standard devi- deviation, which is measure of risk of stocks after inflation, is lower than bonds. So if you, you know, we actually go, when you're looking long term through a long term retirement, the higher equities you had, the more sustainable it is, um, um, but, and the more more bonds you have. Bonds tend to get killed when you have high inflation, and if you have high inflation somewhere along the line or rising interest rates in your retirement, they tend to get killed. So, so that's kind of the, the surprising thing is you need to be a higher equities when you retire to get a higher allocation. However, you have to be within your risk tolerance. You got to know what your risk tolerance is stay within it and if it's mostly bonds then you need to withdraw a lower percentage and ed when you crunch those numbers why what did that kind of portfolio consist of from the equity side was it assume was it pretty large in canadian equities as well um or like what was it a kind of a typical recommended portfolio or allocation for a canadian uh, yeah well I, okay I, I had to look back on where we have a long like we don't have that uh enough data Going back far enough with Canadian, mm-hmm. so the, the data that I used was U.S. Oh, so okay, I had okay. S and P five hundred, or or you know the Standard Poor's before that, right? And okay. comparing with, with with bonds. However, the I have read some European and British studies where they used you know European and British assets, and they came with the, with exactly the same conclusion. So as long as you're with your risk tolerance and can stay invested, mm-hmm. having more in stocks allows you to take a higher income reliably through uh, through retirement. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I mean, the reason I ask is because if, if anybody looks up the, you know, the 4% rule, uh, basically the, the Trinity study is the famous study that kind of you know, coined like the 4% rule and they explain it and how 4% withdrawal is, is safe based on all these different factors. Uh, but a lot of that is based on, on US data. And so that's why I was curious about, you know, if you, when, when you kind of did your numbers, you know, how would that differ for Canadians, right? Because if somebody is, is in the US and they're uh, the, probably the largest portion of their portfolio is in, let's say, the S&P 500 or the total US stock market index, that's different than a typical Canadian, right? Who has, you know, might, might have, let's say, a third of their uh, equity portion in Canadian stocks, which is a lot more than what a typical American would have, right? And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, what are your thoughts about, 
you know, when we talk, we hear about the four percent rule. There's a ton written about it. It's a lot of U.S. data, basically. H- how does that impact Canadians? Do you, you know, what are, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I th- I'm sure Canada would have the same result as U.S. or Europe or Britain or anywhere else. Mm-hmm. The more equities provides you a more reliable um, growth. See, the problem is through it, through retirement. It's, a, it's a retirement is long. It's thirty years, forty years. You, you're looking for a growing income. Right, so fixed in income is good for fixed income, but it's not good for growing income. Right, so if you're in Can- in Canada, I'm sure you're going to end up with the same, uh, the same, the same as you were with the with the U.S. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it'll it'll be it'll be the same mix. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, no, that that sounds uh, that sounds good. Um, yeah, I was just curious, like if if you think the percentage would be, uh, the, you know, like the safe withdrawal rate would be lower maybe for Canadians than the U.S. just because the U.S. market tends to grow, has historically grown more so than Canada, yeah. you know, something like that. Yeah, there isn't really that much difference. Okay, like Canada long term makes you know with the last seventy years, Canada's made ten percent U.S. ten percent a year. U.S. has made eleven. Right. Okay. So it's not it's not material enough where. You know where right. when when we read these studies, like we look at the Trinity study, you know the four percent rule, all that, where we say, oh well, that doesn't really apply to us because we're Canadian. It's like you're saying that it, basically the the difference between the two markets are are not really material enough where that would make such big of a difference where the whole strategy for Canadians would change completely. Right. Mm-hmm. What 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 I found is I, I've read a bunch of studies on it that had a big problem is that they don't go back nearly far enough. So if you have a study that only looks at data at the last 30, 40, 50 years, that's, it's completely irrelevant, this, the, the entire study. Because we've just been through a 35-year period from 82 when bonds were at 20% and 2016 when they bottomed at 2%, and now they're, they're back a bit rising again, right? So we had a 35-year period where bond returns were almost as high as stock market returns. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, – sorry – I just got to put this call on hold here. Give me one second. Sure. Yeah, so bond returns were almost as high as stock market returns, okay, for that whole 35-year period, but because rates were, were falling. So anybody who does a, uh, you know, a test of the 4% rule in that period of time is going to get a completely misleading result. And I thought most of the studies that I saw out there didn't go back nearly far enough. Now, my study went back all the way to 1870. 150 years of data, and and that's I think it's it's much more informative. Even even covered you know the Great Depression and what happened what happened back then. There's been a few periods of erratic markets and high inflation in history, and, and it, it, I think it's a much more reliable result that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, I I really enjoyed that article that you did. You clearly spent a lot of time. Uh, finding all the information, summarizing it. Uh, I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes uh, as well for anybody that wants yeah. uh, an easy way to, to find it. Uh, obvi- obvi- obviously, it's on your site uh, at rempel.com. But, uh, yeah, it's, but it's, link called, to- it's called Rules of Thumb mm-hmm. on, on my site. So, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm an unconventional wisdom guy. I, I find it so often when you actually study something, you find that what most people believe isn't really what works and is something that's actually not true or not optimal and there's much better ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. So that's what I kind of get off on is is finding the, you know, what really works and how often it's different from the conventional wisdom. Mm, that's right. Um, yeah, no, it, it's great. And there's a lot of really good articles on there. And, uh, and yeah, in this podcast, I mean, uh, Ed is a uh, guest that, that that's, you know, come back uh, and he's going to come back on some more episodes as well, where he shares some of these uh, findings he, he kind of did in his studies. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just really valuable for for us because yeah, he does actually go in there. He, he doesn't just go with kind of with the general kind of g- generic easy advice uh you know he actually does crunch the numbers he looks at the actual data he looks at the history uh you know he's got a big background in this yeah how, how many years have you been at this ed now it's it's been quite a while right <laughs> 24 years 24 years yeah so it's uh yeah it's, it's one of the definitely one of the more reputable sources that i've been able to find here specifically for canadians so i think it's uh highly relevant and yeah for sure i'll, I'll link to all of that in the uh in the show notes as well um but yeah let, let, let's let's move on to the next question so when we uh, you know talking about withdrawals when we wish to withdraw some money from our investment portfolio how do we decide whether now is a good time 
to sell off some of our equity portion or whether we should instead sell off a portion of our bonds or maybe use some of our cash cushion instead. So for example, earlier this year, we had a bit of a dip in the markets. Now, if somebody is in, let's say, traditional retirement or early retirement and needs some cash flow right after that dip has happened, how do you decide whether to sell at the temporary, uh, whether to sell some of your equities at the temporary deflated stock prices or whether you should use some of your cash you have saved up, you know, like your emergency fund or your cash cushion or whether you should be selling off your bonds instead? Um, right. So I think w- when you do this, it's a good question, uh, Cornell. When you do this, I think um, what I find the most effective uh, method is to have a target asset allocation and keep working towards it. So most of the time, uh, at least with both of our clients, we're, we're talking about a regular monthly income that we're getting. Or like it's it's usually not big big lump sums throughout the year, or or maybe one, but usually it's mostly monthly income. And we're we're look back once over, uh, at the, you know, the beginning of the year, we're looking for what we're going to withdraw throughout the year, and we're trying to work back toward towards our target. And this actually gives you a good discipline that helps you make make. Uh, smart decisions automatically. So rather than buying, you know, taking it all from one place or all taking from another, um, you just, I'm trying to be 75% equities, 25, 25% bonds. Okay, so I look at my portfolio, equities. So if equities have been doing well, your, your equities might be ahead of that. So you take a higher percentage so that you're trying to work back to the 75, 25 allocation. Okay, so by doing that, you automatically are selling the asset that's been performing the best recently and, and less of the one that's been performing the worst. But I would caution not to take, you know, um, uh, a big market timing and just say, okay, I'm going to take it all from one or take it all from the other. So uh, so in market timing, I find there's only one time when humans effectively make market timing decisions well <laughs> or can make them well. And that is after a big market decline. And let's say if you have a market decline more than 25 Twenty percent in stocks. That'd be a good time to take it all from bonds and try to leave your stocks because they're almost definitely throughout history they've always come back like from from big declines. But any other time, you should just avoid you should avoid market timing. Like whatever you think is going to happen in whatever your short term prediction is, uh, you're just as likely wrong as right. Understood. So what you're saying is, let's say let, let's say the stocks have dropped significantly let's say we had quite a bit of a correction so you're saying uh, step one is to rebalance and because stocks have gone down that means you probably now have a higher portion of bonds in your portfolio than you would like to have based on your desired asset allocation and so you sell off um and so you sell off some of the bonds uh, and then you can use that uh, basically to live off if, if you actually need that money and by taking that money out of bonds you're now at your desired asset allocation um that, that's that would be phase one is that right right so uh, you, you can do two ways one way is you, if you actually rebalance right if you rebalance back, back to your asset mix then you should do the same withdrawal every year just like if you're if you're if your desired is 75 25 and every year you're going to rebalance to 75 25 then you should draw, also withdraw 75 25 and that's it mm-hmm. so what i tend to do is uh, tend to not rebalance, but just use the withdrawals to, to work towards it. Right. Right. So at, if we're at, if we're at 80, 80, 20, I'm trying to get to 75, 25, we just take a bit more from equities that year. So we're working, working back towards the 75, 25. Mm-hmm. So that's really all I do. Now, interestingly with, um, with my clients, um, if they're kind of a different, breed, I think, than, than the average investor out there. So most of my clients, even my retired clients, tend to be 100% in equities. And part of that is um, maybe it's the types of people that, that find me or because I spend time educating them or because they're working on a plan or because um, we just talk about a long-term focus. There's a number of reasons. But so, so for my clients, it's usually not stocks versus bonds. It's, it's you know, your global equity versus your Canadian equity kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a much lesser um, it's much lesser issue then it's not so much if there's a you know if there's a market crash it still generally affect, tend to, tends to affect all of them. 
so I, I only actually do it if we uh, if we get you know significantly out of whack on our uh, on our desired allocation. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so with your clients because there are so many of them are a hundred percent equities. When when there is like let's say we had a, a sizable you know correction, like, you know let's say it's like you know twenty percent correction, let's say or or um, or even you know, let's say go extreme, let's say it's you know like fifty percent, right? If something like that, then okay, you you kind of wh- where do you take that money? From? from because you don't want to sell at when it's at such a low as well right you don't want to like especially if they're 100 percent equities right you don't have any bonds to uh, kind of take out um to not be selling those stocks at the deflated prices so what do you tell them i mean do you tell them to have a bit of a cash cushion set up so that they can kind of ride out the storm that way or do you do something else well you know interestingly is so first of all 50 percent is, is extreme so right able- right uh, outside of the uh, Great Depression, mm-hmm. there's only we've had a couple of the, couple times when the market declined a little over forty, but that's the biggest that we've ever had. Right, and it tends to bounce back pretty quickly. And so the saying here is, a lot more uh, money has been lost trying to avoid market corrections than actually <laughs> actually in them. So uh, the things that people do to avoid, you know, the fear of what happens when it falls are all are all worse. So. If I have clients that are 100% equities and we have a 40% crash, like we did in 2008, we still just keep withdrawing the same as normal, and think and things tend to work out. So, you know, if, if those years you might think, say, you know what, it's a good idea to maybe take less if you can, if you can. Right. And yeah, there is a bit of disadvantage because you're selling more low, but every other method is worse. So when I studied holding cash, and I found holding cash as a long-term thing, like you know, uh, one year is withdrawal rate in cash or whatever if you're holding cash it drags down your returns and the effect over your retirement is worse than it is if you have you know the odd time where you're selling low odd stocks and same thing with you have if you have more bonds if you invest more conservatively every every other method to avoid it has has a bigger effect so best thing is just just go with your allocation just keep taking a little bit all the time you know, if, and, and where, what I'm doing with my retired clients is we always monitor the withdrawal rates. So we're starting at 4%. You know, if, if it's a big crash, you find all of a sudden you're at 5 or 6%. So you got to make sure you manage it. And then we're trying to work it back down to, to 4%. And it, it tends to go there over time on its own. But often we try to take a little bit less and try to work back towards the 4% method. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So, if, yeah, so if there's a correction, let's say, you know, 20%, then... You say, okay, yes, still take out the money because you need it because you're retired. You have no income coming in other than what you're getting from your investments. So you get them to use that. Ask them, you know, if they can take less, then definitely take less because stocks are at pretty. Um, because yeah, you don't want to be selling at the low if if, if at all possible. Um, but then I guess you, you you kind of crunch the numbers in your models to make sure that okay, are they with this correction? How, how do things now look twenty, thirty plus, let's say years down the road, whatever the case may be, and just try to kind of work work their way back to kind of a, a, a kind of a nice sustainable scenario where they are still withdrawing the money at kind of the rate that they want to withdraw it at and at the amounts they want. Exactly. Yeah, gotcha. that's that's really all it is. Yeah, and what I found in my study is, you know, and through his, through history, there's been a few large crashes, but if you just still keep withdrawing, in history, it has bounced back. Mm-hmm. Right. And and while and what I found in my study is, um, the more it's it's almost uh, it's uh, it's well not a straight line, but it's the the more bonds or cash you add to a portfolio, the more likely you are likely to run out in a thirty year period. So. The fact that it's you know that that it's fallen twenty or thirty percent and you're still withdrawing your equities, um, don't worry about it. Like you have to, you have to uh, put your mind on a long term. Like don't think about the year. Mm-hmm. All your decisions investing wise should always be long term decisions. And you find if you if your thought process is long term, then you tend to make much smarter decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that, that's great. I think I I think you explained that uh, that well. Yeah, it's always. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, especially here at your angle, because it's like you said, so many of your clients are 100 percent equities. So yeah, what what happens right when when you do have that you know kind of 20 percent correction, that kind of a thing. Um, so no, that, that that's uh, it's great to get your insight on that. So uh, and in your article as well, just going back to that, you mentioned that because of the 2008 crash uh, and the low interest rates, there's been an influx of investors that have been buying up dividend paying stocks. And so because of this, you say there's a bubble with dividend stocks. How do you determine that it is in fact a dividend bubble? How do you approach something like that? I mean, 
the interesting thing is you can often just see it most just by how popular something is. So I see in, in the investment industry, dividends are just talked about everywhere. You know, there's probably a hundred blogs out there of people that do that are doing nothing but dividend investing. It's like it's become a big, big thing just on its own. And uh, but you know, I think the uh, the important thing here is that what we're looking for with investing is total return, right? So whether that return is growth or dividends, uh, it doesn't really matter. Long time, it's 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 long term total return. So I tell you, I, I tell you, I hear this thing called uh, you know rainfall and snowfall are both precipitation, right? So it doesn't matter which one you get; it's which it's a it's a precipitation. And I find that when when people start focusing on um, on uh, yield, uh, they tend to start making stupid decisions. And there actually isn't is a saying like that in the industry: when you get a yield, you get stupid. So I'll give you an example. So you ask somebody, would you rather have an eight percent total return with no dividend? Or a seven percent total return um, with a one percent dividend, and, and of course people say, oh, well, "I'd rather get the dividends on here, right?" But so, but I said that's eight percent total return versus seven percent total return, right? You're getting less money overall. Right? So, um, so I, I think it's uh, the important thing investing wise is to focus on on the total return. So, if you're evaluating dividend stocks, to me is is you should evaluate them just like you other do other stocks. You look at the valuation, look at the PE, look at the earnings growth, look at the management, look at their their product and their industry, the moat that they have, as Warren Buffett would call it, and um, and don't focus much on the dividend. It's that's that's whether you get that that money as a dividend or whether you get it in long term growth. Uh, it works out the it works out the same. And that's another. It's a Warren Buffett quote: Investors should be agnostic about dividends. So whether you're, you know, whether you're getting, if you're getting eight uh, percent with a seven percent growth and one percent dividend, or a five percent growth and three percent dividend, you're still getting eight percent. So, so that's what you should look at. And right now, if so, so if you look at it long term, of course, uh, over the long term, dividend stocks make a bit less than the uh, overall stock market does, and it's you know it's, kind of, it's an arbitrary subset. And of course. The, um, Dividends are have done a lot like what bonds have done, right? We've had this 30-year bull market in bonds when interest rates were up and rose or declined. So bonds have done well in the same period of time. But now we bottomed in 2016, and now you can expect dividend investing likely to lag for uh, like at least to lag the broad market. And what we've seen in the last while, it's technology, it's bank stocks, it's growth stocks that are now uh, leading uh, Leading the market, and when you're buying dividend stocks, you're you're missing some significant parts of the of the broad index. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And, and just to make sure I heard you right, are you saying that um, I guess what, what you read or what what you uh, found when you asked people that they would rather get a seven percent total return, uh, but, but but they would prefer that over an eight percent total return, just because in that seven percent part of that is the dividend. You're saying people actually. They're, they're, they would some prefer to actually have a, a lower total return if it means that part of that is a dividend. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, because it's funny because I asked this question for people. Actually, let's use ten percent as a number. Would you sure. rather have ten percent total return, right, and no dividend, or an eight percent total return with a three percent dividend? Now, people keep thinking the dividend is on top of the total return, but not the dividend is one component of the total return. Right. Understood. Okay. Gotcha. Right. One component of it. So, and it, people get focused on this dividend, but uh, you know, I, for example, in my portfolio, I don't even follow what the dividend rate is. Like almost the vast majority of stocks pay a dividend anyway, so you can't really avoid them. <laughs> but the ones that pay very high dividends. Are tend to be the low, the slow growers, right? So, um, but I mean, I mean I'm, what I'm what I'm saying is, I think it's most effective to focus on the total return that you're going to get out of owning your your equities long term, right? And and don't get don't get caught up on on what the dividend is. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And then Ed, another thing um, that I think it's on the minds of a lot of Canadians is the potential for rising interest rates. What tends to happen to dividend stocks when interest rates rise? And what about more growth equity, uh, sorry, growth oriented portfolios or just kind of broad market type portfolios? Yeah, dividend stocks, especially high dividend stocks, we often call them bond proxies, right? So it's it's one thing if you just have a, a normal stock and it pays a one or two percent dividend, that's 
that's that's just kind of normal. But the ones that pay the higher three, four, five percent dividends, we call them bond proxies, and they trade often to a fair degree. They trade like bonds. Like I was saying, they they do well in declining markets, in declining interest rate markets. They lag in in uh, in rising interest rate markets. So that's what's happening now. So if we're now interest rates bottomed and they're rising. So you can assume that that generally bonds and bond proxies aren't going to necessarily do that well. Um, but growth por- growth portfolios. It's, I mean, it's hard to say anything blanket because there's different markets. All kind, there's, there's all, always many effects in an overall market. But in general, growth portfolios tend to do better in a rising market because rising interest or rising interest rate in the market. Because if if interest rates are rising, it usually happens in a time when the economy is quite strong and there's a lot of growth going on, and it's it's just a favorable environment. So it's not because interest rates are rising. But it's because they tend to rise in in uh, environments that are favorable for uh, for growth portfolios. Gotcha. Yeah, like government increases the interest rates because to, to kind of combat the inflation that might be happening because of all the growth that's been happening at the companies, that kind of thing, right? Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then, while well, on the subject of potentially rising interest rates, let's talk about bond ETFs for a second. So, when building a portfolio with a portion allocated to bonds, what are your thoughts about using a bond ETF that's all government bonds versus all corporate bonds versus an aggregate bond index ETF that basically has some of each? Um, okay. So, just so you understand what what the difference in an effective is, corporate bonds uh, tend to have higher yields but shorter duration. So very often they're five years or less, while government ovens are often 10 years or even 30 years. So, uh, so that's kind of, it's kind of the difference. So the effect on it, when, when rates are rising, it's generally going to hurt the government the longer duration ones more than it's going to hurt the shorter duration ones. Okay? So that's, that's kind of the effect that's happening. Um, my advice here is the same thing for... Um, uh, for index investors, that you're you're better off sticking broad. So again, if you're trying to become active, where I'm going to choose all corporates or all all governments, you're starting to make these these theme based bets. And to me, is if you're if you're an, if you're an ETF, if you're an index investor, then you know stick stick with the broad. Buy buy the aggregates or something that's got uh, both corporate and and uh, government on it, because. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, it's not easy easy as to make these predictions as, as you might think. So right now we think, okay, rates are going to rise, so therefore government bonds are going to do worse and corporates are, are, are going to do better, right? It's not true, not necessarily true at all, because the current expectations are already built into the price. Okay, so we, they're already expecting, you know, two or three interest rate rises of a quarter percent in Canada and maybe three or four in the States. It's already expected and that's already built into the price. So rates can actually rise, and, and government bonds would do well if rates rise less than, than is expected. So that's why you can't just pick these themes based on, oh, I hear rates are going to rise, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest based on that. It's, it's more complex, and that's why it's better to stay broad. Um, the other part to it is, you know, if you're, if you're buying corporate bonds, you're, you're adding some corporate risk. So if, um, if you're thinking to buy all corporate bonds, uh, a better bet would be stick with a broad-based um, bond portfolio and then perhaps um, have it be a, a bit smaller allocation and, and add a bit more stocks. Because if you're going to take, take corporate risk, you're better off doing it with, with, uh, with, with stocks you know, than, than, uh, than with bonds. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have one thing here. I call it the bond equivalent MER, and it's some. It's, it's actually kind of interesting because I find when people switch to um, uh, index investing, there is a tendency to have higher bond allocation than they would with other kinds. Uh, so, for example, you see mutual fund investors; they often have a higher allocation to stocks than you than you see with, with ETF investors. And the uh, so here's my here's my my little rule to remember. I call it the bond equivalent MER. So 15% bonds equals a 1% MER. Okay, 15% bonds equals a 1% MER. And that's in terms of the long-term expected return on your portfolio. That's what it is. And that's assuming the 1% MER, you know, is not paying for something that's, that's, that's of value. So if, if, you, um, if you have, so for example, I had a guy, Jim, that was, 
he uh, he was he, he owned a bunch of mutual funds, and then he wanted to get rid of them because of uh, he found he was always you know lagging the world. He always com- compared it to the MSCI world and he was lagging a little bit. So he said, okay, I'm gonna get rid of these high fee funds and I and he bought ETFs. However, the funds he bought were all equity funds. Now he went 80 percent equity, 20 percent 20 percent bonds in in his uh, ETF portfolio. All right, so. Um, so he was 80-20. Now what he found is when he compared himself to the MSCI World Index, he was lagging just as much or even slightly more than he was. And it's and it's because he's gone to 20% bonds here, right? So so I told you your total your total bond equivalent MER, uh, your 20% bonds, which is a 1.33% bond equivalent, plus you have your um uh well there's there's the there's the, the cost the tracking error of the ETFs. So a global um generally US in um, ETFs tend to be about a half percent below the index and global about 1%. So if you, with his global global portfolio, he's about 1.3, 1% below on tracking error, the total return of the of the ETFs versus the uh, MER plus 1.33 because he's in 20% in bonds. He's, he's probably he's lagging the index by 2.3, which was a little bit more than, than he was lagging with, with the mutual funds. So. Interesting rule there. So, he, so, that, so that's kind of my, my uh, goes back to my thought. You're better off whatever bonds you have, stay broad with them. And if you if you think that that's you know too much in bonds or whatever it is, or or you you're worried about the corporate por- that you you want to have more corporate portion of it, it's better to have a bit more in in, uh, in stocks instead. Gotcha. Because yeah, like one of the I mean, when I was looking at you know, corporate bonds versus government bonds versus just an aggregate bond index, you know, it seems like the corporate bonds are they do provide a higher rate. Uh, you, you you do get more interest from those bonds, which uh, you know logically I think makes sense, right? Because if, if if you're buying a bond from a corporation, that's higher risk for you than buying one from the government, and so they will, you know the, the corporations will compensate you a bit extra uh, because you are taking on that extra level of risk with them, you know, compared to the government. So my my kind of thing I was thinking was okay if you're getting a kind of a, uh, a an ETF that has just corporate bonds nothing fancy just kind of you know broad your know, kind of blue chip type companies you know very sort of you know relatively stable secure companies that kind of a thing and if you feel confident about that okay all these kind of gigantic blue chip companies they're not just going to go kind of bankrupt like you know your your bonds are still going to be uh you know are you know are, are going to be around um, then why not go with corporate bonds then ones that are more have more government in them because you're going to get a bit more return and yeah they're not as safe as government but they're still you know pretty safe right considering relatively safe right compared to um you know doing something like high yield bond or something like that i mean what what are your thoughts about that kind of logic well they are going to be somewhat more volatile right so it's you're going up the risk curve right so uh with government bonds you go to corporate bonds you know, blue chip cor- corporate bonds, you're a bit more risky and you should expect a bit higher rate of return. Then you go to high yield, which are, you know, more risky equities, but high yield bonds, you buy, buy bonds, even higher rate of return, but more risk, right? So you get more volatility plus, you know, there is default risk that some of these companies may not be able to pay, right? So so uh, it's not just rate of return, it's it's return and risk that you're, that you're, uh, that you're going up. Right. Right. So, but let's say, for example, instead of going, uh, uh, instead of going twenty five percent all corporate bonds or whatever it is, um, if you get an example, so maybe maybe what you should do instead of that is stick with the broad base for the bond portion, but have a but have the bond portion be slightly smaller as a percentage and have a bit more equities. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Right. So you, what you're actually doing, so you, you know, part of it is you're taking extra risk. Which, if you're taking the extra risk, you get a lot more return by going in in equities. But also, you're making a bet that interest rates will will rise more than the three the three rate increases expected. Mm-hmm. If they rise more, then corporates will do better. But if they rise less than the three, then then um, government bonds might do better. Okay. Okay. You know, so it's it's uh, it, there's a tendency to think that that. It's that simple. Rates are rising, so corporates will do better than governments. It's it's just not that easy. The markets are much more complex than that. 
Gotcha. And then how do you know how they differently they behave in different economic climates? So when you know if you had like a two thousand eight, for example, how did do you know how corporate bonds? If you had like a ETF that's just all corporate bonds, kind of you know blue chip type corporate bonds versus kind of a, a nice mix aggregate bond index. Do you know how that how those deferred during a big economic crisis like that? Yeah, yeah. So corporate bonds fell, of course, a lot more than government bonds. So their corporate bonds, they're um, you know a part of the way towards equities. Let's say you're a quarter of a third of the way towards equities. So you have more downside risk when the when the stock market does bad. Your corporate bonds may do worse mm-hmm. as well. Um, so, however, if interest rates fluctuate, they tend to affect the government bonds more in both directions. Right. So, right. But but you with with corporate bonds, you're getting some of the risk and some of the extra return of of being in equities, of being on you know, companies versus versus governments. Gotcha. So you you would say you're still taking on that extra bit of risk even with corporate bonds, even though these are you know like really blue chip. I mean I mean if I'm thinking you know like Rogers and and you know Bell and and you know some of these you know really really established companies that you know realistically are probably aren't going to go. Gonna, they're not going to be defaulting on their on their bonds, right? In, in, no, if, if, the there's a, if there's a stock market crash, you can expect the corporate bonds to fall as well, right? Just because people are, right. are are basically getting out, period, they're getting out of equities, they're getting out of corporate bonds, they're right. they're it's, running uh, in droves to government bonds where they feel safer or cash. Yeah, yeah, because they're, they're safer, right? So if, yeah. if stocks are crashing, then you know it's a risky, more risky environment than. Then people are more worried about their government bonds as well, or their corporate bonds the corporate as well. Bonds, gotcha. So, so you will get you will get more volatility with corporate bonds in a in a very volatile equity market. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. But you're only getting a little bit higher yield. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, 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 it's not a lot. Yeah, it's um, you get quite a bit higher with high yield, but then it's you know it's again more risky again. Right. So, you know, so this goes back to my my advice for index investors. Stay broad, right? So if you're going to buy bonds, just buy the broad ones. Um, and if you think you should buy more corporates, then buy a bit more equities instead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that that's great. No, that sounds uh, that sounds good. I think you've answered that well. Um, now, Ed, you're definitely a popular returning guest on the show. But for anybody not familiar with you or your practice, tell us a bit more about yourself. All right. So I'm, I'm a fee for service financial planner and tax accountant. So I prepare. I do two basic things. I prepare financial plans for people for a fee. Um, and then I take on a certain, then from there you can take the, the plan and you can do it yourself, or I can help you m- implement it with what I call full service. So just to talk about those two things, uh, first of all, the financial plan is, uh, the value of a plan is a lot more than you think. So I've done nearly a thousand of them. And most Canadians uh, very few Canadians ha- have a proper plan or really understand what the effect of it is. So I mean, a lot of people may have had what I call a fake plan, like something you get from the bank or something. But uh, a true financial plan is a GPS for life, for your life. It tells you what exactly your goals are, when are you going to retire, how much you do you need, exactly how much you need to put away to, to get there. You want to save for your kid's education, pay off your mortgage, whatever. You have all your various goals get control of your debt. So, so all the goals are put into one document. We've decided exactly how, what's the best way to achieve them all. And um, it gives you peace of mind. It gives you financial security. It gives you the freedom to do what you, what, what you want with the rest of your life. And, you know, the vast majority of Canadians are going to retire with way less than they want to have. What will happen is they'll retire and live. They'll just force their lifestyle down to what money they have after that. And it's because, you know, it's because they didn't, they didn't plan to fail. They failed to plan, you know, as we say. So the, 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 uh, the effect of a financial plan is a lot more than people realize and, uh, or the benefit of it. And I can tell you, I've done nearly a thousand of them and nobody's ever questioned the value after they receive it. You know, before you're never quite sure what, what are we really going to get out of this? What am I going to do differently? But after they receive it, everybody, everybody has actually always seen the, the value of it. So, so I charge thirty five hundred bucks for a plan, and um, but I uh, I I re- refund a thousand of it if you become a full service client of mine. So that only costs twenty five hundred bucks. I also have a couple versions like for millennials where I only charge a thousand on a what I call a plan discussion. There's a few that are on my uh, they're on my blog on the uh, a tab called the fee for service advice. So. 
Now, for those that, that take on the full service, so full service is for people who want to be in control to, of their whole financial life. They want to know they're on track for all their goals. They want to know that everything is being optimized, their cash flow, their debt structure, lowest taxes, most effective investments, you know, most government benefits. And they have, you know, their own money guru that they can ask any question for. To. So I, when I take on a full service, I'm pretty selective on who I take on. I only take on clients if I'm looking after their their entire finances. So I want to uh, I want to look after all their long term investments. I do their personal tax returns for uh, uh, for no charge, or at least I at least um, offer to, and you know give them advice in all areas of their finances. And it's I find quite a lot of people actually want that. They want to know that one guy has you know, one has control of or knows everything every part of them, and. Um, to me, if you're ever going to have an advisor, you should always have one, not more than one, because more than one is, you know, you get competing advice. And and uh, so having two advisors to me is no better than zero advisors, but one advisor that knows the overall picture uh, or works out well for you. Same reason you have one family doctor and not, you know, three family doctors. So um, now my clients tend to be mostly from I guess about three groups. They're quite a broad mix of ages, but um, probably the biggest group tends to be people, you know, 30s to 50s that are growing their wealth. But a lot of them are very technical, you know, accountants, engineers, IT people, and it's people who are very technical and actually see the value of the of the advice. And I think maybe it's probably because of my articles are quite in depth, and it's people that actually actually read them. So uh, there's a certain number that are of my clients that are actually you know, very successful, high income people, but very busy lives and families and busy, busy career. And, and, you know, they, they know they can't manage everything effectively. And, um, and I guess the third group is what I call the honest people, people that are honest with themselves, because I have a fair number of clients that have told me, you know what, I've been trying to do things, but you know what, I don't know what the hell I'm doing with my finances. So I need some advice on it. And I find, you know what, the, the single biggest drag on the finances of people of Canadians, there's two things. One is not caring, and the other is thinking you know when you don't. You know, so, um, so those are probably the, those are probably the three big uh, the, th- the three big groups. So um, now, when it comes to the investing part, um, there I still follow the advice that I gave here. I have basically two approaches: there's the broad index approach, and there's the all-star fund manager approach. And some people prefer one over the other. Um, it, it's, I, that's fine. Like it's, I go with whichever one, you know, makes more sense in your case. There's some tax different differences, but for the most part, I go with whichever one you're more confident in. Now for me, when I go with the index approach, I have what I call the index plus portfolio manager. So he's, he's, I think the only one that, um, in Canada that, that, um, makes his money almost entirely based on beating the index. So his, his, his fee is 0.25%, similar to an ETF, plus 20% of whatever he needs the index by. Right? So there is, I, I look at it as a, look at him as an ETF, plus a, quite a good chance of being getting returns above the index um, versus, versus, you know, dra- dragging the index, with, which is what you're going to do with most, most ETFs. So the other option is the all-star fund managers, where we actually go with um, mutual funds and we're, and we're picking them based on the very best fund managers out there. So those are the two best, two, what I think are the two best. You either pick broad indexing and then you pick and you pick a guy that's performance based or you pick uh, you pick the very best fund managers and you let them manage it for you that way. So, all right, so that's, that's basically what my, uh, what my services are. Um, outside of that, I do a lot of blogging. So you can, you'll find I actually really enjoy the blogging and and trying to educate Canadians. And uh, so they, the articles may be a bit in depth, but I think you'll find they're, they're very different from what you get out in, in most of the, uh, most like when, what you see elsewhere on the internet. And I try to be you know, very highly educated or ha- highly um, um, educational. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I hope it makes a big, big, uh, big difference for readers in, in educating them on what they do. All right, no, that's uh, that's great. And yeah, I, I definitely, like I said before, I, I'm a big fan of your articles. You definitely go very in-depth. You actually do the math, you crunch the numbers. Uh, you, you know, it's just kind of one of those uh, 
bloggers that sort of spit off the sort of generic advice that that's been said and rehashed over and over and over again right you actually you, you go in there you, you you do the math you look at the numbers you look at their research and and yeah and what's interesting is a lot of times like you said uh, like the name of your blog you actually gives some unconventional wisdom as well because sometimes there's these things we hear all the time and then you come in and say actually i've done the math and here's where there's or you know like like like, like with the, the withdrawal rate like for the four percent rule for example right you said uh, well, yeah, that's right. But there are some caveats you should be aware of. So don't expect a you know like a four percent safe withdrawal rate if you're eighty percent bonds, right? So uh, you know you kind of go in, you, you sort of uh, go in deeper to make sure people actually understand everything and and the math behind it instead of sort of you know going with these blanket kind of easy uh, statements, you know where where they may not actually be fully accurate. So I I do like how you go the extra mile. And that's why you know I like having you on the show, um, you know, to go through some of these studies and, and this research that you did because. Uh, because yeah, yeah, I do think it's some of the highest quality uh, out there. So, um, so yeah, thanks again for being on the show. It's, it's always uh, it's always fun. Um, I'll uh, I'll be sharing the link for the uh, for anyone that wants to get a free consultation with you as well. I know we've kind of you've agreed to do that for Bill with Candle listeners as well um, to, to see if you guys are a good fit and that kind of thing and get some questions answered. So uh, yeah, thanks thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. It was fun, Cornell. All right, fun as always. All right, take care, Ed. All right, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ed. Just a reminder that Ed is offering that free 30-minute consultation where you can get some of your questions answered and you can get that by just entering your email at buildwealthcanada.ca slash ed, that's E-D. And I've set that page up so that when you sign up, you'll automatically be emailed the guide that I made on the top questions to ask your financial planner or advisor. So you can ask Ed some of those questions if you'd like or use it on your existing financial planner or advisor to see if they are still the best fit for you. So that link again is buildwealthcanada.ca slash ed. And just a quick reminder before we wrap up the show and a big thanks to CanSpace for sponsoring the episode. If you're a Canadian business owner and are looking for a reliable and affordable web hosting provider to host your website, you need to invest in local Canadian web hosting. And CanSpace is Canada's favorite provider. Super fast and affordable web hosting, a 30-day money-back guarantee, and they'll even help migrate your site from your current provider for free. And the best part is all Build Wealth Canada listeners will get $10 off the plan of their choice. So whether you already have a business or are just thinking of one day starting a blog or business on the side, visit buildwealthcanada.ca slash host and enter your email address to secure your free coupon while it's still available. You can use it now or whenever you're ready to get that business started. So secure that coupon for free now by going to buildwealthcanada.ca slash host. All right, that's all for this week. Have a great one and talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca. 